Please excuse the uh, cough. It's not the coronavirus. <laughs> Sit easy, it's okay. Um, just recovering from a bit of a bout of uh, bronchitis. But... So how will we feed the city? Um, I have just joined uh, this company, District Eating, which is based um, in Sheffield. Um, and my boss, Faye, said, would I step in and give this talk? Um, so I have very subtly tweaked it to my own area of expertise, which is supply chain sustainability for fresh produce. So you might see a little bit of a, a sort of trend in that direction. Um, but fortunately, that's what everybody else is speaking about tonight as well. Um, so it sort of works quite nicely. So um, as we've heard from the previous speakers, um, we are in a really interesting place with our current food system. So um, we're seeing increasing globalisation. This has brought us new and exotic products. We've kind of completely abandoned uh, seasonality. So we can make these delightful um, strawberry fried Christmases. Um, <laughs> But unfortunately, what that's also allowed us to do is externalise our environmental impact from our food. So all sorts of things are happening in our name that we're not really um, aware of. Um, and one of the sort of um, cases in point is the damage to the La Doniana region in Spain, uh, which is literally being dried out by the sort of um, demands of agriculture, which of course is very, very important to the Spanish economy is actually being sort of dried out in that region. What we're also seeing is this sort of strange situation whereby we have this uh, ever-increasing uh, access to new and novel uh, fruit and veg, but actually within the UK, um, we're not eating it. There's still um, a lot of people who do not get their five a day. Um, and we've got an extraordinary lack of self-sufficiency. So the UK imports 84% of its fruit and 43% of its vegetables. Um, and that looks um, set to increase, particularly this year, where there's not really anything in the fields yet. Um, and we are increasingly vulnerable to shocks in that supply chain. We have rising demand for food, water, energy, increasing environmental degradation, political instability, extreme weather, and climate change to contend with. So no small uh, challenge, really. Um, and we still live in an era where people go hungry. So it's an extraordinary sort of situation um, to find ourselves in. So uh, what District Eating is trying to do is to access waste CO2 and waste heat from industry to site uh, greenhouses in the UK. Now, what you will often hear if you look in the media um, at the moment is greenhouses in the UK, um, you know, is that necessary because actually uh, sort of um, looking about food miles is not as important a consideration as actually what you eat itself. So a sort of conversation about whether you want to eat meat versus vegetables. Um, and they will cite this piece of information. So um, there's a website called Our World in Data, which um, has published that document um, saying about how food miles is really not that important. Um, for a large portion of the year, we are better off shipping in a tomato from South America than grow one in a local greenhouse. Mm. I sort of challenge that viewpoint a little bit. Um, and I'll tell you the reason why. If we can utilise waste heat and CO2, those figures change dramatically. I, I would uh, question the way they've calculated those figures, but I'd also um, sort of put in that challenge. And the reason being is, it's more complicated than just CO2. Um, so what they're saying there is that in uh, southern Spain, for example, they are using sunlight and their natural warmer temperatures to reduce their energy bills in producing food in their greenhouses. Um, and much of the assessments around sustainability use single metrics, obviously the pound being the primary uh, one, but also the CO2. Um, but to truly examine sustainability, and actually what we want to do next is build resilience in our supply chains, you need to really examine multiple metrics and the trade-off between them. So let's examine that in a little bit more detail. Um, so the sort of work that I was doing um, before joining District Eating is looking at this multi-metric picture. Um, so if we go back to our example of strawberry growers, if we don't just simply look at the energy input to growing those um, and the heat required to grow those, but we actually look at the water scarcity of the farms that we're taking the produce from, the flooding risk, the water quality, their um, laws in that area around environmental protection, 
their institutions and governments and protection, the level of biodiversity importance in that area, some of the social metrics around media scrutiny and actually what big corporations can get away with in those locations and how ethical that is, some of the political, um, geopolitical situations and the conflict and the soil salination. What we find is the countries that we source a huge amount of volume from, so Egypt and Spain, for example, rank really, really poorly currently, their current situation compared with uh, the UK and Portugal situation. So we're really sort of missing this multimetric picture when we're talking about sustainability in terms of purely CO2 and uh, energy inputs and profitability. The other thing, of course, is how will that change in the future? So um, what we then did was take climate models of maximum temperature, so really, really hard limits to growth, beyond which, if you have these temperatures, you literally cannot grow. Uh, so that would be the x-axis, and then on the y-axis would be uh, water scarcity. And what you see is some of these really, really good source countries like Egypt and Spain are beyond this threshold of 30 degrees for production, beyond which we're suffering uh, negative impacts of temperature. And actually, the United Kingdom, these farms down here, are sort of doing a lot better, although we still are starting to see um, those extreme weather events. So we know that this, this picture is changing as we go forward in the future. So 2020, it's already been an absolute blind, haven't it? We've had floods, we've got Brexit coming, we've got the coronavirus. I mean, it reads like a scientific horror story. Um, so it's just sort of a really interesting time to be alive, I guess. <laughs> um, so um, <clears throat> bringing it back to sort of how we're going to feed Sheffield, excess heat, CO2, we've got some really interesting industries based here in Sheffield. We've got steelworks, we've got cement works, we've got incinerators, we've got on-farm um, sort of heat pumps, all sorts of things. Um, and so teaming that with advanced agriculture, already has been mentioned as sort of drawing from these um, heat networks. This allows us to improve our local food security, build supply chain resilience, create local economic growth, positive social outcomes and reduce food miles, even though I feel that's a little bit of a tainted concept. Um, and this is probably where Faye, if she was here, would be able to get into all the sort of engineering details of it. But there's just a myriad of benefits to this. And um, we're, we're seeing this in the sort of the rise of the urban farm. There's some really interesting uh, sort of examples of this um, in Paris, where they were having um, these basically the decline of the car in uh, inner city urban Paris, um, where they've basically costed it out. So they're having these large underground car parks with sort of fully empty, and then they were being used for sort of drug dealing, prostitution, that kind of thing. So they've taken these spaces on and started um, putting in urban farms. And it's a massive win-win in terms of local production, social benefits, um, all sorts of things um, from, from that kind of um, concept. Um, and allowing people once again to see where their food is produced, um, using those spaces in a myriad of ways, using it as an educational tool, like the student chat that we've spoken to, um, and all these things. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And obviously this is where I get really giddy about it, <coughs> the food security um, and the environmental benefits as well. So um, one of the companies that I worked with in Kent um, they are all wrapped up in the red tape of what Brexit's going to mean, trying to get their uh, fresh produce through um, the port. But actually their biggest problem in recent times is once their lorries get through the port, they can't get to their warehouse because of the flooding. And it's just such a simple, simple thing. Um, and people haven't been able to get into work because of the flooding. And the knock-on effects of that are just huge. Um, but it still takes a little bit of time. And this is just some of the... Um, examples of these kind of vertical farms and I think um, people are very put off by the slightly space age nature of them um, but I think there can be huge benefits um, as well. This is another example of a sort of more conventional greenhouse setup um, on brownfield sites in the Midlands. Um, so one of the sort of my pitch to the audience I guess tonight is if you um, know of any um, industry where you work or you're sort of aware of which produces a huge amount of waste heat or CO2, please get in touch. 
um, because we do so much feasibility studies for our, on 5K um, to try and utilize that and sort of make some positive changes. 